Hello, and welcome to One Stop Co-op Shop, your one stop for board game news and reviews. Hold on to your pants, it's time for a special episode. Hey, I'm Peter and I'm here with Steve. Hey guys, Steve here. And for this special episode, we also have Jerry. Hi all. I, you know, I, I held off that time. No, oh, thanks. I didn't say, hey oh. <laughs> Steve, do you get that reference? Um, which movie? I'm not sure what movie that's from. It's from the old WWF wrestlers. The, they were called the Bushwhackers. They were a tag team. Oh, yes. I vaguely remember that. Peter yes. goes really highbrow with his references. Absolutely. <laughs> so for those of you out there that don't know why I always say, hey oh, after Jerry says hi all, go look up on YouTube. I'm sure they're there. The Bushwhackers. They, uh, that was their signature yell as they, as they came down. See, educational and fun. That's right. All right. Well, today we're going to talk about our experience at Gen Con because we just came back. So if our voices are a little scratchy, which I know mine is, then that'll explain it. So let's get things started here on our Gen Con episode. First thing we did was meet up when we got there, right? We all met up at the Fantasy Flight in Flight Report. So do we want to talk about that a little bit? Let's do it. All right, Steve, you had tickets. I actually didn't have a ticket, but Steve had an extra ticket because Colin ended up not coming. And then Jerry ended up getting in because they had like a waiting line outside, but they let all those people in as well. So we all got to go to the in-flight report. So Steve, what was something you took away from it you were excited about? So if you're not familiar with the in-flight report, this is the meeting or the showcase where Fancy Flight Games announces their new games and their upcoming plans for the rest of the year and into next year. And so Peter and Jerry, myself, and Terrence, we happen to got tickets to this, and we happen to uh, catch it. And this is my actually my first time seeing it live in person. I normally watch the stream. What about you guys? No, that's my first time there too. Yeah, I haven't even seen the stream before, so this was my first time in general being there. Cool. Yeah, so we were there and just seeing what they had. And I know the first cooperative announcement they announced at that was Final Hour. And this is a Arkham cooperative, almost like a Clue type game. So the premise is the old one has already been awakened and you have just the, an hour, basically, of game time. It's really eight, eight rounds to try to seal the gate and, and save the, the world. Cool. I know you're going to talk about that one a little bit later because I think you got a chance to play it, right? That's correct. Yeah, and then the other big announcement, at least in the co-op world, was the new Marvel Living Card Game. So I know we're all pretty excited about that, but we're going to talk about that a little bit later, too, because we all got a chance to play that one this weekend as well. Yeah, and they also showed off a bunch of other things. They had uh, some new products for their generic RPG setting called Genesis. They had some new X-Wing stuff and some new Armada stuff. I think the other major announcement was the Marvel Champions, which is a miniatures game with the Marvel Universe. There seem to be sort of mixed reactions to that. Uh, They did have that available for demo, but not available for purchase. Yeah, it was definitely more of a board game audience, you could tell. And I think the announcement of a miniatures line was received kind of mixed just because it's a board game audience. I think if you had more of a miniatures game crowd in there, hearing about a Marvel miniatures game probably would have excited them more than the crowd that was present. But I know we have some listeners who love miniatures games, so I think you're going to be happy with that one as well. Yeah, I think they were were a little derailed, too. They had some technical issues at a couple points during the (laughs) uh, presentation that I think messed up the presenters and as well kind of set the crowd off kilter because that they weren't sure where to, where to cheer and where to be quiet and there was some confusion there we weren't very cooperative with our <laughs> uh, applause is really what happened <laughs> and then afterward they were showing off to media they were showing off some of the games and unfortunately we didn't get a chance to go check that out because next thing we did was went to an escape room so i just want to bring this up and then after this we're going to change the format back to talking about the games we played one at a time. But I thought this was a really cool event. It was a neat idea Jerry came up with for something to do to kind of get us together with some of the listeners of the show. And we had a really good time. And not only that, but we set a record there. So, well, at least a daily record. (laughs) This was actually my first time doing Escape Room. It's been something I've always wanted to do. So it was really fun to do with you guys. So what did you think of the experience, Steve? I really enjoyed it. I felt like we had a lot of people for that small room. I think I would probably like to try another one again, but with maybe a smaller group um, or maybe a a bigger room with like a lot more to do and spread out. But it still was really fun to 
kind of work together. And <laughs> there was one moment where we were trying to figure out the height of the room for whatever reason we need to. It's not important here. And I remember Peter was asking, okay, guys, look in every corner. We got to find out where this is. And we're looking around. We can't, we can't find anything. We're looking around. And so we asked the, uh, go on the, the, the microphone there and ask for some a hint. And the guy in the, the line says, look outside the jail cell because we're inside the jail cell. We look outside a jail cell, and right there in the corner, which Peter was talking about, was the uh, the tape measures to indicate the height of the room. We're like, oh my god! So, <laughs> yeah, it was it was one of those moments. It's like, all right, come on, we were there. We just needed that one little push. And it's funny. I mean, bringing this back to board games a little bit. It, I mean, it happens with escape room board games as well. It's like you know how to get there. You're just missing one crucial piece of information. And even if you think you're on the right track, sometimes it derails you. So. That's why I like hint systems, both in real life escape rooms and in board game form as well. The moment that stuck out in my mind was when we were all sitting there pushing the code in and we're all staring at this keypad and it turns green. And we're like, what's going on? And we're sitting there hitting the keypad over and over and it keeps turning green and nobody knows what's going on. Then we turn around behind us and there's this door swings wide open like in the jail cell it had been open the whole time and we're like sitting there for five minutes trying to figure out like what this keypad was doing oh yeah that was a blast yeah it was a lot of fun uh i was just looking for something we could do that was in the cooperative vein and this place had that uh, session open at when on wednesday night for the jailbreak session and we had the max player count for that room it was six but some of the other rooms had larger player counts like eight or ten but I wanted to go with the smaller one because it was, it, they called it intermediate difficulty. And, you know, some of, I think most of us are traveling that day. And I know Peter and I had been driving for like 10 hours or whatever. So we were looking for something that was a little bit easier to get through than burning our brains out on Wednesday <laughs> night before Gen Con. And I'd also like to point out, we've been driving 10 hours today as well. We literally just got in less than 30 minutes ago. So we may be a little burnt out on this podcast as well, but that's all right. We're powering through. All right, Steve, I know you got a lot of new games in. So first thing we're going to do, the format is going to be obviously a little off for this episode. We're going to talk about a lot of games we played at Gen Con. First, we're going to cover the cooperative ones. Then we're going to go into the non-cooperative games. And then I think we're going to round it out with maybe some games we didn't get a chance to play, but some things we maybe got a short one-turn demo of or whatever else that looked interesting to us that we want to point out to you guys as well as potential things to keep your eyes out for. All right, Steve, I think you probably got the most gaming in. So what was your first cooperative game you wanted to talk about? Since I mentioned it first on the episode, I think it's fitting to start with this. And let's start talking about the game Final Hour. So this is that cooperative game from Fantasy Flight Games where the great old one has awakened and you, the investigators are trying to run around this university to try to find the clues to seal it. So the basic gameplay is it's kind of interesting. It's got like a, almost a Gloomhaven mechanic to it where... You draw an action card that's specific to your character, and it's got top action and a bottom action. The top action is normally very good, and bottom action is normally not so good. <laughs> so it's normally pretty bad. And what you do is you look at this, and you need to, and everyone has these what they call priority cards, and they have a number on them. And so in secret, without, or without talking to everyone else, you put your action card face down and put a priority card face up with a number showing on top of it. And you take turns doing this. Basically what happens is everyone does this, you look at the numbers on the on the cards, and then uh, because you have to resolve four action cards, you resolve them in ascending order of the number priority on top of it. And so the first two cards you resolve, you do the top half, and the second two cards, you do the bottom half. So it's a really interesting um, mechanic where you're like, man, I, I really want to do the top half, but is my top half better or worse than someone else's bottom half? And trying to read people and try to figure out how to do that was kind of interesting. Um, but anyway, you run around and there's, this is more, feels like, I don't know, pandemic-ish than like your normal Arkham Horror type of setting. And it plays pretty quick. It can play about an hour, that's about right. And it plays usually in eight rounds. And as you're running around trying to find clues, trying to discern what the answer key is in this. So what were your thoughts on it? I, I don't like the game with rules as written. And I say that because... If you read the rule book, you're not allowed to talk while you're putting these priority cards on these action cards. That's fine. I think that's a that's a fine way of not strategizing. But once you start resolving these cards, you know what your card's going to do. But technically, you're not allowed to talk about that until you can flip up your card. From a strategy standpoint, at least. And so it doesn't feel very cooperative where, like, 
someone else is like, okay, I need to move three spaces, and they move to a spot, and you know on your card that they're going to take some damage. But technically, as how, as how I read the rule book, you're not allowed to strategize or talk about that. And I, in a cooperative game, that's what I want to do. I want to talk and discuss things and strategize. And with that rule in place, it just, I don't know, it just fell flat for me. Now, if we house rule and say, okay, and during that phase you can talk about it, then then I like it. It's not a great game overall, but I mean, take take for what it's worth. You know, it's really interesting because I didn't think about that. I thought the top and bottom mechanic was actually pretty clever. So as Steve said, you know, the, you put priority cards on top, which are numbered one to whatever. And whoever has the lowest priority, those two cards get their top action. And the, the highest numbers get the bottom action. So you can kind of pick and choose which one you're going to do. But it never occurred to me before that you know what and where that bottom action is going to happen. So normally in cooperative games... The enemy phase is kind of the random part or the part you don't see coming. But it never occurred to me before that with this top-bottom mechanism that you would actually know what's coming. So, yeah, that knocks it down a peg for me on my want-to-try list. I don't, Jerry and I didn't get a chance to try it. Yeah, I didn't get that. I haven't seen anything on it beyond what was presented at the in-flight report. But what they showed didn't really grab me or made me feel that I needed to see it immediately. Uh, I was just going to wait for the regular release and see what the reviews say. The other thing that's kind of weird about it, too, is the enemies move in a path around the board. They try to find an open spot they can go to, and sometimes that path can be completely closed, like you have like almost an endless loop. And it kind of it takes a while to resolve sometimes. So if you don't ha- want to take a lot of time resolving enemy actions, this one might not be for you. I mean, it's not a huge deal, but I'm just pointing that out. So that was Arkham Horror Final Hour by Fantasy Flight Games. So, Jerry, what's the first one you want to talk about? Well, I think the first co-op that we played was Horrified. Uh, it was in the Board Game Geek Hot Games room. Peter and I were there Friday, uh, and we gave Horrified a try. We played it at the easy level, which is two creatures. Well, to rewind a bit, the the theme is you're kind of like a monster squad, where you're going against the classic universal movie horror monsters. So you got Wolfman, Dracula. Was the mummy in there at all? I can't remember. Mummy, um, Swamp Dude. Yeah, a Creature from the Black Lagoon. So we played against the Creature from the Black Lagoon and Dracula, which was the recommended starting game at easy level, which was uh, two creatures. And it was a fairly light co-op. It was ridiculously easy. I think at no point did we think we were in fear of coming close to losing. Uh, we just absolutely destroyed it. So I need to play it again before I give a full review, uh, because I'd like to see it at... You increase the difficulty level by adding monsters that you have to defeat. One thing I'm a little concerned about is that I think the game might get a little bit easier as you go on, because once you defeat a monster, they're removed from the game, basically. So as instead of ramping up the difficulty as you uh, are ramping up the tension, I think it might have a problem where you're actually reducing the tension by having to face fewer monsters as you've solved some of the puzzles. But overall, I mean, it, it, I think it'd be really good for families. I think kids could get into it. They might not really mesh with the theme because they might be too young to understand, you know, the Universal Monsters or have seen Monster Squad or something like that. But I think the weight of the game and the aesthetics of the game were family friendly. Now, Steve, did you get a chance to try this one? I did not play this one, no. Yeah, so I have very similar feelings to Jerry. It's funny, you talked about the tension ramping down, and that's exactly what I I called Mike and told him afterward. That was my biggest concern with the game. You know, Mike and I really like tension increasing in a game. That's why we love Forbidden Island so much, because as you remove the tiles, you're also removing the card from the deck. So now that deck gets smaller and smaller, so you have a more likely chance of getting cards that are already there. Well, this does the exact opposite. As you defeat a monster, as Jerry said, you're removing them from the board, but they still have cards in the deck. And so that's the problem. You'll flip up cards of a specific monster, and that monster is no longer in the game. In fact, only starting with two monsters, I think there's five in the core set, three-fifths of the cards didn't even do anything. You know, they did activate the monsters, which maybe they move one space and attack for one dice or something. But the top part is where the monsters got their cool, unique feel from. And, you know, three-fifths of the cards did absolutely nothing. So I definitely want to try it at harder difficulty. I definitely want to start with more monsters on the board. But my fear is the same as Jerry's. As the game goes on, you know, you're going to have less and less monster cards that do anything in the game. And so that is my biggest concern with the game as well. But as a family game, as a light game, we had fun playing it the whole time, I think. Yeah, I agree. It was was fun playing. 
but the difficulty is not quite there. I think kids will be fine because of the kind of cartoony nature of the artwork. I don't think, you know, you have to worry about your kids getting scared or anything. I do think it's a nice family weight game. So that was Horrified, which you can pick up in your local Target. All right, Steve, back to you. What was your next one played? Let's talk about Dawn Shade. So this game isn't out yet. It will be launching early next year on Kickstarter. But it's a kind of adventure leveling up RPG type game. And so this reminds me a little bit of Too Many Bones, but with some notable improvements. And I say that just because it's all chip based. So like your token, your character is a chip and you put, you put health on a health stack behind, underneath it and your conditions go on top of it. And you have like a hex board where you have circles to put your, your chip stack on it. So it kind of reminds me of that in that regard. But it's, it's dice chucking. It's actually a pretty different game, to be honest. And so this is your adventure game, and you're going to be moving around as a party, exploring a land, and you'll be flipping up tiles, and they'll have different events, and the events will tell you to look in a book, and it has a nice narrative in it with some choices to make. Like, okay, you come to a swamp, do you want to go the long way around, and we'll head to the swamp, and different things will occur. And the one thing that was really interesting about this game that I liked a lot was a mini dexterity element to it. So, for example, oh yeah, you decide to go through the swamp, and now you come across a track. Okay, now you need to try to, like, avoid this trap. Instead of, like, doing a skill check or something like that, you actually build a mini dexterity game on the board. And so for the trap, for example, you, put, you stack a bunch of chips in these columns, and then you had to roll your chip, like, between these columns without knocking them over. Or, like, if you went into town and you uh, wanted to uh, practice your, your shooting, uh, you could then flip the board over and there's a bunch of targets on the back and you would, you know, flip your chip with your thumb in the air and see where it landed and see what prizes you got, for example. And there's a bunch of these, like, little mini uh, dexterity games sprinkled throughout this experience. And that was really, really fun. Is combat handled similarly or is combat completely different than these other mini games? Combat is completely different and that's a dice-based system. So you level up, you can choose your different stat lines if you want to focus on attack, defense, hit points, that, you know, that normal type of stuff. And you have uh, spells or abilities you can use, which you can trigger if you have enough magic resource. And so you are like praying to God and trying to get these elemental properties to power your, your magic spells. And so that's all the kind of dice chucking and action assignment type stuff. Now, this was pretty fun. I do have a hesitation from the experience I had was I felt like there was an opportunity for snowballing. We'll see what's going to happen in that final product. But the initiative order when you do combat is you put all the tokens in the bag to represent heroes and monsters, and you reach in the bag and pull like I only like four of them or something like that. And so then you'll play the order of resolution with heroes and monsters attacking. And then when you're done with that, you put them back in the bag and do it again. And if you were to kill a monster, well, then you pull one of those monster tokens out of the bag. Well, now you have a greater chance of having more heroes activating and less monsters activating, which could let you kill monsters more easily and so on and so forth. And likewise, the opposite of that could also be true. So I'm not sure what the end result's going to be, but that's my one big hesitation of it, is if that is a factor. We didn't see it a whole lot in our game, even though we did uh, struggle a little bit winning in the combat. But otherwise, the game was fun. Lighthearted uh, theme. The, the artwork I saw was very, very cool, very lighthearted. I liked it. Cool. I'll have to look into that. What was the name of it again? Dawn Shade. Yeah, no, that sounds interesting. I mean, sometimes when they try to put all these mechanics together in one game, it gets a little bit overwhelming. Maybe they spend too much time working on one element or the other and kind of forget the core of the game. So hopefully they don't do that here. But, you know, overall, I, I do like the sound of a lot of what you're talking about. All right, Jerry, what's the next one you got on your list? So the next one for me is, I think it's one we all demoed, but it's the Marvel Champions Living Card Game that Fantasy Flight announced during the in-flight report and was available for demo, but not for sale at Gen Con at their booth. So I, uh, Steve, you did the demo, right? I did the demo, yes. Yeah, so Peter and I played together. We played, I think you were Captain Marvel, uh, I was Iron Man, and there was also She-Hulk and Spider-Man. And we played a very straightforward scenario. It was those four heroes against Rhino, and it was a very simple just do enough damage to the boss before he defeats you with his scheme scenario. And the way it works is each hero has two sides to their card. They have their alter ego, which, for example, for Iron Man is Tony Stark, that has one particular power. And once per turn, you can flip the card and it becomes the superhero version. So, uh, you know, in Tony Stark's case, Iron Man. And the different sides of the card have different powers and uh, different abilities. So 
when you are the alter ego, for example, with Tony Stark, you can have a hand size of six. And the enemy, when it's the enemy's turn, doesn't attack you. Instead, it adds additional points to the, it's what they call it scheme, which is the overall timer for the game. But if you're on the Iron Man side, then the enemy on its turn will directly attack you. So Iron Man only has a hand size of one, but he adds each of the tech cards he has laid out in his tableau when he was on the Tony Stark side, and that adds to his hand. So basically for Tony Stark, you have to add, invent and add your armor before you're really any good as a superhero. Uh, but some of the other superheroes, like I think Spider-Man, could pretty much right from the get-go dodge and web people and do all sorts of things. So each of the heroes felt very different. The theme was pretty good. Overall, it felt, from a game perspective, it felt like Arkham Horror combined with Lord of the Rings, a uh, living card game combined with Sentinels of the Multiverse. It took various elements from each one of those and sort of combined it. I'm not sure it's better than any of those. I liked it better than Lord of the Rings, but we won't have that argument on this podcast. But I'm not sure how it compares to Arkham. All right, Steve, what did you think of it? I absolutely love this game. I was a bit hesitant when I heard the announcement just because, you know, it's well, it's Marvel's big IP. doesn't mean it's a good game or not, but I really wanted to, to try this because I do love superheroes. I have Legend, Marvel Legendary, for example. It's one my wife and I play all the time. And so sat down at the table and played this, and it was awesome. I loved every bit of, of it. It plays really fast and really fluid and very cooperative, and, and I loved all those aspects of it. And the whole superhero and alter ego setup is very interesting because if you take a lot of damage on your superhero form, you flip to alter ego form, lets you actually heal a bit to, to recuperate. But while you're doing that, now the bad guy, the villain, is now progressing on his evil plot or scheme to you know lose the game for you. So you really have to balance when you're in your superhero form to take out that bad guy versus recovering. So it's ebb and flow. And you can play any card to help anyone else at the table. So if you're, for example, if you do know Lord of the Rings LCG uh, terminology, like every ally, every character has Sentinels in range. You can block for anybody, you can attack from any, anybody, it doesn't matter. Hey, that guy's in front of you, let me help you out. I'll go block him for you. Or you know, that guy's in front of you, let me, let me shoot him with my web and help you out. And it was really fast. And the other thing that's really cool about it is, unlike Arkham and Lord of the Rings, your resources are the cards in your hand. So you actually discard cards in your hand to pay for other cards in your hand. So you have this plethora of resources from the right out the get-go. And so it's a really interesting dynamic like, oh man, I, I want to play this card. But is it more important to play this one card and get rid of these other cards I don't need right now? It just makes the game really fast and fluid. And this one I absolutely loved. Yeah, and the other part of that is you redraw your hand back to six every turn as well. So not only are your cards your resources, but you're actually actively encouraged to use them all every turn because you're going to get a full hand of cards refreshed either way. So if you only use five of your six cards, you're only going to draw five cards. If you use all six, though, you get to draw six cards, which I really like. And for me, the enemy AI felt a little bit like Lord of the Rings because the enemy is attacking everybody. And to do that, you put a card face down in front of them and use the bottom part of the card and it may boost their attack or whatever else. So that's very much like Lord of the Rings. And then they deal another enemy card and that goes in front of you. So similar to either Lord of the Rings or even Street Masters, Brook City, any of those modular deck systems. For me, it felt like a combination of that, but I actually liked it better than all of them because I think of this resource management. It felt a lot lighter. You felt a lot more heroic. You weren't struggling against the system the whole time. Now, this being said, we only played the first boss, the easiest boss, so who knows? Next time I play it, it could just be crushing and soul-sucking. I actually did play the different boss than you guys. I played the second boss, which was Claw, and he was kicking our butts. Okay, but there isn't going to be, at least at this point, just like with every living card game in the cycle, there aren't going to be that many cards you're going to be able to cycle in and out, so I'm sure that right. the core set is going to be balanced so that you can defeat it, even with the basic stuff. So if you're not a deck builder, I think that, you know, for somebody like me, that appeals a lot more, that I can just lay it down and start playing. The other thing that appeals to me, which we haven't covered yet, and they covered in the Fantasy Flight Report, is how they're going to sell their boosters. So unlike Arkham and Lord of the Rings, you're not just buying scenario packs as you go along and getting a few cards to add to your hero decks. You can actually buy hero boosters, which will get you new heroes, so you can buy just the heroes you want to play with. Or you can buy enemy boosters, 
And then they're also going to have a third type of booster, which is more of a campaign system, which maybe there'll be more story arcs to them as well. So we don't know exactly what it's going to look like yet, but I do like the model for how they're rolling it out, where you're going to get more heroes and you can kind of pick and choose which heroes and enemies you want to add. And something else they did differently with this uh, game is instead of forcing you to buy more than one core set to have all the possible cards you need, they have instead put all the cards in one core set. So you only have to ever have to buy a single core set. Now, they did increase the price by 50%. It's now 60 instead of 40 like Lord of the Rings. But it's something that a lot of people were clamoring for because people would be frustrated to have to buy multiple core sets and really all the stuff that comes with it other than the cards is useless to them. The other thing they do that's unique here, which I just remembered, is you have these ally cards that come out. And unlike Lord of the Rings and Arkham Horror... Instead of these cards sticking around forever, every time they do an action, which is either to attack or to work on the scheme, then they take a damage. So they only have a certain amount of life, so they're not going to stick around forever. You can only have three allies, and they will go away pretty frequently. So, you know, you are the hero of the game. It's not like these other games where you're building up a team of people to go fight. You are the heroes, and these other people show up for a couple seconds, do some damage, beat up some stuff, and then kind of go away. So I thought that was pretty neat, too. Another thing we haven't mentioned yet either is the contents of the villain deck. So this is kind of aligned to what Arkham does, which is pretty awesome, where you have a thematic bad thing that your character has to do within your deck that ties with the, the character class, right? But in Marvel, instead of having this bad card in in the investigator deck the bad card is in the villain deck and so for like t'challa uh the black panther character um his bad card says oh you have to head back home and take care of things back in wakanda and so if this card pops up while you're flipping cards for the villains uh you may have to automatically revert from black panther form into t'challa form this alter ego to go go do this and so this may be an, a really bad timing for you but you really have to like figure out what's the risk and reward for uh, flipping for this and when that pops on the deck, like how, how to manage the system. And every hero has this negative effect t- tucked into that villain deck somewhere. Yeah, that was really cool. I mean, as you guys can probably tell from listening to us, we've talked a lot about this one because we all really liked it, I think. And, you know, it is the one we've probably spent the most time with all of us together. So, I mean, I am really looking forward to this one. Colin was there with us as well. I know he already pre-ordered it. So I really do think this is going to be a hit for Fantasy Flight. Alrighty, Steve, what's your next one that we haven't talked about? Let's talk about a newer game. That's Pandemic Rapid Response. So this is a game I know Peter and I played. Um, Jerry, did you play this one? No, I haven't played it. Yeah, this is a newer game. It's actually a two to four player, or maybe one player. You might be able to play solo, I'm not sure. But a real-time pandemic game where you are all on a plane trying to gather resources and drop off supply crates to help with outbreaks in various cities. And so each round, you have two minutes to complete the round before you need to resolve some events. But as you roll your dice, you can use the dice to do various actions. You put the dice on the board to trigger gathering resources. When you gather resources, you have to re-roll those dice to see how much waste is produced. If you produce too much waste, it's a fail condition for the game. And then once you produce those resources, you do have to actually move the plane around the outside of the board to the location and then initiate a drop-off for that. And if you can drop off the medicine for all the different locations, you can win the game. Yeah, I had a lot of fun with this one. The one thing that was interesting is it's a real-time game, but it's a real-time game with turns. So while I'm rolling my dice, everybody else at the table is kind of helping me out and maybe even directing me a little bit. It's almost like everybody's the alpha player for the current player because they have a hard time taking everything in all at once. So it was really neat to kind of help each other out, move things around on the board. And when that player is done, then the next person gets to start rolling and taking their turn. And even when the two minutes is up for this timer, all you're doing is pausing for a second adding another city to the board, maybe adding one of these cards that increase the difficulty a little bit, and then get right back to playing. You're not allowed to discuss strategy or anything else. So it's not like the game stops. You just pause the game to kind of add a couple things in. I thought it felt really neat. It felt really tense. I, I really like this one. I think it's a good family weight game. 
it felt like we could go a little harder with the difficulty, but it didn't seem like it would be that difficult to scale it. You just add more cities in. So, yeah, for me, that was an absolute winner. Yeah, I played this a couple of times over the con. The first time I played was without those events. And it felt a little, I don't know, I didn't have all the tension I wanted in it because those events really mess up your plans and have to reevaluate. Because the first time we played without those random events, we knew we were going to win, which kind of going through the motions at some point. But with those events popping, it really helped. But I agree with you, Peter. I do think this game, at least for us, needs to be played on a slightly higher, higher difficulty. But I liked it. This is a good one. I do recommend this one. Yeah, and it's certainly something that, like a lot of these good cooperative games that are meant to be for families, we're talking Pandemic, we're talking Forbidden Island, we're talking Forbidden Desert. They have a really good way and an easy way of scaling the difficulty, and I think this fits right in that line. It's very easy to scale difficulty. You add cities, you subtract cities, you add events, you take out the events. So it can be played anywhere from families all the way up to gamer group. I think this one's a real hit as long as you like real-time rolling games and those don't bother you. I think you're going to like it. All right, Jerry, back to you. What's the next one? So on Saturday, Peter and I did a demo of God of War, the card game. So that is a cooperative card game set in the God of War universe the, the, from the video game. I'm going to let Peter describe what was going on with that game. But before he does so, I'm going to go on a little rant. <laughs> we had I participated in, I think, three demos this weekend at, at Gen Con. And two of those, the ones put on by Fantasy Flight and by another one we'll talk about in a few minutes, were really well done. They explained the game. They were there to answer questions. They got the rules right. But the third one was this God of War demo from Simon or Come On or whatever they're calling themselves now. And unfortunately, the demo person did not know the game, did not explain the game. What they did explain was wrong half the time. The character I was given to use for the game explicitly doesn't have a turn. It's really just a support character that acts on other people's turns. And it wasn't explained to me how that character actually works and how it plays cards. And the the whole experience was very, very frustrating. So if there's any publishers that ever listen to this episode, please, please, please make sure your demo people know the game and know what they're doing and have the time available to sit and explain what's going on. There's nothing more frustrating than sitting down, having paid for a ticket to participate in a demo and have no idea what's going on with the game. I mean, it was so frustrating for me that once the rules explanation for what it was worth was given, I was ready to just get up from the table and walk away. So with that, I will let Peter describe what the actual game was. Yeah, and, you know, this isn't an uncommon experience, unfortunately. We had the same thing happen a couple of years ago when we were at Gen Con with the Hidden Movement Middle Earth game. Oh, Hunt for the Ring. Yeah, yeah, we had a very similar experience where the demoer didn't know the game. I mean... I understand that, you know, you can't get everything right and you're going to miss a rule here or there. But if you are a demoer for a game, you really got to play that game five or ten times before going to a con and trying to teach it to people. This wasn't the first day of the con. This was Saturday. So it was the third day of the con. She had been, she complained because she had been demoing it all day. She's like, I was thought I was supposed to get relieved. So maybe that was part of it as well. She wanted to get out. But really, we asked rules questions And she would answer and it would be completely wrong. And it's not even like basic stuff. It was like fundamental rules questions that changed the difficulty of the game. So, yeah, that's a little bit frustrating. I understand this isn't a full-time job for the demo people. But they should have some full-time employees on hand or nearby that can help out and assist with the demos. Or at least make sure that they're being run correctly. I mean, they don't even collect feedback forms for that. So, I mean, there's no way for the companies to even know whether their demo people are doing a good job or not. A little bit of a rant there. But let me ask, Steve, did you play this one? I did not play this one. I did watch a few rounds of it, though, when Colin and Terrence were playing it. Yeah, and Colin had the same response as Jerry did. There was a character in the game that's this floating head character that just attaches to someone and basically assists them for the round. But they literally don't get a turn. There are five characters in the base game. I don't know why they're using this character in the demo. Now, we didn't play with the other character in the game, which was two characters. So maybe that character was a little more complicated or something. But I think putting this character in a demo game when you had another choice was a bad choice for the company. I think it made the game look bad. But let's cover the game. We've complained a lot about the demo itself. But let's talk about the game. Because I actually... Thought there were some neat things in there. I do want to acknowledge up front, though, that the rulebook wasn't the best. But I think the game itself had some neat concepts. So the way it works is every player in the party is 
got their own hand of cards. And those cards could be melee attack cards, they could be ranged attack cards, or they could be modifiers to those, like plus two, plus three, whatever else. Or there are also these purple cards that give you additional effects. Like they may say, heal somebody, or block all damage from somebody. Various effects like that. There are also shield cards in the game, which when the enemies attack you, you have those shield cards. So the way the game works, it's got a little bit of a deck building element. So one person's going to take their turn, unless of course you're the floating head, which doesn't get a turn. So on a player's turn, they are going to have two fight actions and one move action, and they can do them in any order. And to do those actions, they're going to play their cards. So moving is free. You can move from any location to any other location. But to do an attack, you're going to play either a melee or a range card. And then on top of that, you can play any modifiers you can do, so to add damage. And you're going to do damage to either the character in the first row if it's a melee attack or the character in the back row if it's a ranged attack. And there's this, it was an eight card grid. So it was four cards in the front row, four cards in the back row in the scenarios that we played. From what I understand, though, it can get even bigger or smaller than that. And you're moving your characters around, you're attacking with those cards. And then when you're done your action, the enemy takes their action. The way that works is you flip the top card off of this enemy deck and it tells you who triggers and every character on the board who's still alive and every enemy character is going to have a symbol on it and any characters still alive that have that symbol are going to trigger and attack they usually either attack their column and or the column adjacent to them so doing damage to the players players can play some defensive cards to mitigate some of that damage And so that is kind of the basics of the turn. Now, after all the characters have activated, you flip over one more of these cards to do one additional attack to the party. After that happens, then starting with the first player, everybody gets to draft those cards. So not only do those cards have the enemy cards have symbols on them showing you which enemies activate, but they're also cards that you can add to your deck, which are much more powerful than the cards you initially have in your deck. It feels a lot like God of War in the fact that there are a lot of little weenie guys, and then you have this big boss that you're fighting normally. They're very cinematic things that you have to do with the game, which sometimes leads to frustrating moments, but at the same time, they're very cool moments as well. Well, another aspect of the game is when you've completed a particular scenario, it has sort of a branching narrative. So when you complete the first beginning scenario, you are then given two options on how to do the next mission. And whatever one you don't choose has some sort of story behind it, like what happens because you didn't do anything about it. And then you go on and do the other choice, the the choice that you made. And then after you complete that one, there's a series of three cards that you choose one of, and that's the final boss that you attack. So the way the story branches within a compact sort of scenario-based system was kind of interesting. I don't really have much to say about the gameplay because I spent most of the time confused about what my character could and could not do, but I will say that I don't really have any interest in trying it again to find out what my uh, character could do or find out what the game is actually about. So what were your impressions, Steve, just from watching it being played? I thought the artwork was amazing. I want to make sure we call that out because, especially on the boss, like that it's kind of a mosaic we have to assemble different cards to make this big picture that was that looked amazing and on the flip side the cards you actually get in your hand are pretty lackluster just like a plus two plus three but i was watching it it looked kind of fun i don't know i'm not a huge god of war fan i've i'm aware of the video game of course the genre i've never really played it. i've watched people other people play it the ip doesn't do anything to sell for me and i have enough other deck builders i guess Yeah, and I would say it didn't necessarily feel like a deck builder. I think it did deck building in a unique and interesting way in the fact that, you know, the enemy cards that attacked you gave you the cards that you then got to put into your deck. So I thought that was neat. But you weren't getting that many cards throughout the course of the game. You know, maybe two or three per mission. The thing that felt cool to me was the missions were pretty epic. And what you'd do when you defeated an enemy card was you'd typically flip that card over. And sometimes you would just defeat it, or sometimes it would come back or have other effects. So depending on what scenario you were playing. But when you finally defeated it, you flipped the card over and it stayed on the back side of the card. And it's really neat because the artwork changed. You would see the guys when they were originally there. And then on the back side, they would have no artwork. The enemy would change. Sometimes the boss would change. He would move from a ranged attack to a melee attack. So I thought they did some really neat things with these oversized cards that did make up the enemy board. And it was really neat how they combined together to form a really cool picture. So yeah, I think that was ready for you to call out, Steve. That was one of my favorite parts of the game. And I did like the gameplay elements. I do think 
that that one character was a bad one to do in the demo, but I, I would like to investigate it further, but we only played two-thirds of one mission, so I didn't get a full feel for the game. All right, Steve, so what's the next one on your list? Another dem- demo I played was Ni no Kuni, and so this is the board game based upon the video game, if you're familiar with it. The video game's a JRPG, but the board game's actually based around creating a kingdom. And so in this game, everyone's working together, of course, co-op game. And there are, around the board, various missions you have to go on. But each mission will give you various resources. But they're also guarded by different enemies. And so you really have to look at what it takes to defeat that enemy versus the rewards you get. And then you have to figure out if those rewards are going to be good for building whatever kingdom buildings you need to build in the middle of the board. And the whole point of the game is you need to build enough kingdom buildings to get enough points to offset that of the monsters at the end of the game and that of the big boss man you're fighting against. And so it's basically a cooperative Euro resource management system. And you actually have two characters. You have yourself, you have a special ability, of course, and different stats. And you also have a a pet that has just one stats across the board. And so you're working with everyone. We're like, okay, this one mission needs two people to go on it. Uh, but you can send more, but I need minimum two. So I send us two, or should I send just two pets on it? Or who has the right stats to go on this other mission, but these other monsters require these other effects to defeat? Who's good at that? So it's a lot of collaboration on that side. So we played the whole game. It was fun. We enjoyed it. But it's just a fun game. It doesn't ha- didn't have anything that really jumped out at me. It was didn't have really any tension because you are just exchanging resources for the most part. There's There's no surprises. With a few exceptions when you put cards face down. But yeah, that was uh, Nino Kuni. Cool. Yeah, we didn't get a chance to check that one out. I didn't even see it in the hall. And that's the thing about Gen Con. It's so amazing. There are so many games and so many new games. And you would think us covering co-op games all the time would know all of what's out there and what's coming out. But we don't even know all the new co-ops coming out, which is amazing to me that there are that many coming out. So it was a really cool experience. But it's funny. We have different games on our list. All right, Jerry, what's the next one on your list? So the next one for me is, uh, I think, one we all participated in a demo in, but I think at different times, and that is Oathsworn. So Oathsworn is like a half-narrative, choose-your-own-adventure game, half-tactical combat, maybe dungeon crawl-ish kind of game. The demo itself was only, a, it was a quick, maybe 15 minutes rules explanation of how to do the tactical combat portion, and then a couple rounds or... I think for my game is actually only one round yeah, uh, of one combat. Round. And I really enjoyed it. We only played one round of the tactical combat, but the mechanics they had around the characters and how they use their powers is really, really interesting. So it uses a cooldown mechanic where when you've used a power, you put it on one of the sides of your character board that determines how many positions it is away from getting refreshed. Where in the past, some other games have done it where every round you move the card one space so it gets one space closer to being refreshed to your hand. Oathsworn does a little bit differently in that the way the cards move is you play a, another power and then let's say your that power goes to refresh slot two. If you have any cards in refresh slot two when you play that card, the cards that are currently in slot two would move to slot one and the card you just played would go to slot two. And in that way, you can chain how these cards are getting out and getting refreshed to your hand. And it, so it adds a, a degree of interest to which powers you play in order to get your other powers back faster, which I thought was really interesting and something I hadn't seen before. It has two different resolution mechanisms for when you do attacks. It, you can either roll dice or draw cards. The cards are basically representations of the dice that would prevent the overly swingy possibilities from the dice, but... You can choose to use as, roll as many dice or draw as many cards as you want for any attack, but if you roll or draw two blank cards, which is a one-third chance on each to die, your attack completely misses and does no damage. So you have to choose you know, put, how much you're going to push your luck in rolling the dice or drawing the cards. And then it also has like an exploding six mechanism as well, that if you roll a critical hit, you get to roll another die and take that result as well, although blanks don't count for those. But overall, the miniatures were beautiful. The map was nice. The combat was fluid. It took literally five minutes of explanation for everybody to know exactly what they were doing and how to do it. The demo was run very well, and I'm really excited to see the game when it comes out. I believe it's going to be kickstarted this fall. Yeah, I think so. 
Yeah, so, Steve, what were your thoughts? I echo a lot of what Jerry just said. I thought the cooldown was very novel and how that was its own puzzle. I want to mention a little bit about the combat and how dynamic it was. And I remember in our game how Peter was able to, like, throw a baby rat at this giant mother rat and, like, knock it back a few spots and, and knocked itself in a tree, which destroyed, destroyed the tree on the board. Just to give an idea of how dynamic this combat could be. And it's very, very narrative, at least how the person running the demo was describing the, the situation. It really got me into the role-playing mindset, for example. The other thing I want to mention is about the dice and card resolution, how you can pick and choose, and you can you don't have to stick with one or the other. You can change your opinion. And that almost adds another st strategic element. For example, if I'm playing with the cards, and I know I've gone through the deck of some, and I've hit a lot of successes, so I know there's a lot of misses in that deck, well, maybe by that time I want to switch over to dice anyway to avoid those misses in that deck. So it was a really interesting system. I thought it was gorgeous. The miniatures are huge. It was really fun. I, this was one of the uh, higher games on my list uh, for great experiences at Gen Con. Yeah, I think you're gaming the system a little bit there, Steve. You can't take all the successes out of the deck and then switch over to dice. Come on, man. <laughs> That's We call that cheating in our world. <laughs> so, no, I, I think it's there so that if you like dice, you can do dice. If you want to be able to mitigate the luck a little bit, you stick with the cards. So, uh, I mean, certainly you could do it Steve's way, but I would definitely call that cheating in my book. But to give my opinions, I loved it. I mean, I'm not going to hold back. This is my game of the con. You know, Mike talked it up going in. He had played full scenarios of it, and this is what excites me more. He's also played the story, choose your own adventure part of it a little bit more. And I was going in hesitant because Mike gets very excited about a lot of things. And so I was a little bit hesitant going in, but... I love tactical combat and the way it played. It was so smooth. It was so easy to play. It had that dynamic board movement. I mean, that we're doing in spare parts. I don't think it had the degree that we do. It's not pulling, pushing all the time, throwing things everywhere, but it was certainly part of the game. And so I'm really excited about most of the aspects of the game. You know, there wasn't anything that really stood out as a glaring flaw to me. So I am really excited to see what this Kickstarter has. And I'm really excited to get our hands on it and preview it for the Kickstarter as well. Sounds like your demo was a little bit more exciting than mine. Uh, we didn't do any pushing or pulling or anything like that. I think the guy who was trying to do that, he, for some reason, really wanted to roll eight dice. That <laughs> rolled, like, five blanks. And so that was, even though, I mean, the demo person warned him. It's like, you know, you're likely going to miss completely. We were warning him, but he really wanted to roll a big handfuls of dice. So he did succeed in rolling them. <laughs> you know that's the one thing about playing demo games you never know who you're going to get paired with yeah. and so it is what it is and that's fine all right well we do have three more games to cover but they're games they're all games we've done episodes on in the past so we're not going to cover them as in depth what we are going to do though is kind of refer you to go back to those old episodes if you're interested in hearing more about them but these are all games that Steve played. So, Steve, why don't you start with The Captain is Dead, the third installment? Yeah, so I, I enjoy The Captain's Dead series. I have the first two, and the third one was released at Giant Con, so I picked that one up. The premise of this one is you are in a shuttlecraft crashed on this planet, and you need to repair your shuttle by getting alien artifacts that are in these tunnel systems where there's a bunch of insects swarming at you. So I've got a different character set, but it's mostly the same characters from the other systems or other games. And the gameplay plays pretty is pretty different in the fact that you are exploring caves to find these. And you actually build a, the pathways, the tunnel system of the caves yourselves. And you're creating or building these devices to sh automatically shoot in uh, like guns and zappers and force fields to try to stop these these hordes of insects from reaching your fragile shuttle crap before it blows up. So yeah, it was pretty fun. I uh, played it with Barrett from Meet Me at the Table, and uh, we actually won the scenario, and I'll, I'll play some more and uh, let, me, let you guys know my thoughts, how they evolve. Uh, but my initial impression of this is I liked it. I think I still like the second one the best, uh, the one where you try to escape Alien Prison, but I'm, I'm happy to play this one again. Now, does it have a similar system? I've only played the first one to the to the first game where a lot of your actions on the board and they can get damaged, so it limits what you can do as the game goes on. Or do they? Because it sounds like you're exploring more in this one. Yeah, your actions are aren't a little bit different in this one because 
there are actions in the shuttle, of course, but there's only a few of them because the shuttle's small. There's only, I think there's only four. Most of the actions are on the cards near you, and so you're actually out away from the shuttle for most of the time exploring the tunnel system. Well, that's cool. I look forward to uh, hearing your review on that one in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. All right, so we also played The Mind. I finally got you and Colin to play The Mind. Yes, I was super excited to try this because I know you guys have been talking it up. And no, you weren't. Despite your- no, you weren't. Don't lie to the people. You were like, you know, after hearing the description, I'm not sure about it, whatever, whatever. But what were your thoughts? Well, no, I'm excited because it's you. You have been you make this game sound exciting. But, yeah, I mean, the game itself, I don't know. I wasn't convinced of, like, the game itself. But to play with you, I want to play with you because you you make it exciting, right? It, it depends on that. So, But, yes, we started playing it. At first, it was like, okay, the f- one card down. We played the first round. Like, okay, this is kind of okay. Played a couple more rounds into it. Like, okay, I'm starting to understand this. And by after we lost the first game... I was like, okay, I think I understand. Let's let's try this again. And I don't know how many games we played in a row, but by the end of it, I was absolutely loving it. I think we played four in a row. Yeah. And this is the kind of game, so I, I will say, I don't ever explain the rules. I hand everybody a card, and I say, okay, we're just going to play these cards. If Whenever you think it's your time to go, play it. You know, play the lowest. You know, if you think you're the lowest, they're numbered one to 100. We're trying to play them in order. Don't worry about it if you mess up. We're going to lose this first round horribly. Don't worry about it. And then... That's all I explain before the cards are handed, you know, when the first round is going on. The second round, then I explain how the throwing stars work, and I explain that you always have to play your lowest card. All right, those are the only other rules. And then we just play through and usually get beat pretty badly in the first game. And then, uh, yeah, people usually want to keep playing after that. Is it even really a game? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, next su- next subject. <laughs> so, what, so your final impressions were? Uh, I'm buying this one. Yeah. I mean, it really is a fun game. Don't go by the the rules themselves because they sound so stupid that no one would ever even think about buying it. But the gameplay itself is super fun. Well, Jerry, I know you've played it a lot in the past. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, uh, we play it at work, actually, because it's nice and quick and it's people can join in easily without having a long rules explanation. So uh, I like it. It's definitely a game. It's fun. All right. I actually, I don't own it. I own the game, which also includes the cards 1 to 100. So I kind of have multi-purpose there. I use it to play the game and the mind. Yeah, they need to come up with better names. But besides that, the game is really fun. I have played the game in the past, too. Have you played that one, Steve? I have not played that one. Okay. It's, it's similar in form. You have two number ones and two number 100s, and people play their cards either descending from 100 or ascending from one, and you're trying to get all the cards played basically in the deck. So it's similar but very different at the same time. But I, I personally like the mind better, but the game was mo- way more fun than I thought it was going to be. I, I agree. I like the mind better. So, Steve, the last one, set a watch. We just did a review on it last week, so you know my thoughts on it. You know Mike's thoughts on it. You even know Jerry's thoughts on it. So, Steve, we need to hear your thoughts, though. Uh, I hadn't played this game until Gen Con, and I really liked it, and I actually walked away with a copy of myself. Oh, so, nice. It was quite fun. I normally don't like games where you are need to play more than one character. If I can play just one character at a time, that's my preference. So this is kind of the exception to that, but... The dice and how you can use them, how you can utilize good rolls and even bad rolls to be effective in combat and strategize on how to approach these approaching hordes was very engaging and all these special powers and everything. It's got some flaws, of course, to it, but a lot of what you've already mentioned in the podcast, but I like it. This is a keeper for me. Cool. All right. Well, let's, you know, now that we've covered all the co-op games, if people want to tune out here pretty soon, let's give our overall impressions of just Gen Con as a convention. So, Jerry... Let's start with you. What what are your thoughts on Gen Con? Well, I, I enjoy Gen Con. I mean, it is the, I think it's the biggest convention in North America. There's like 60,000 of your closest friends there. You're always running into people you know if you go on to local events and things like that. The vendor hall is a bit crowded. I mean, it, it's hard to get around, but there's so much stuff to see. Like, you'll never feel like you don't have anything to do. Whether you're in the vendor hall or in the demo area or there's seminars, there's role-playing games, there's board gaming tournaments, there's miniatures tournaments, there's pretty much everything you, you can imagine. I've been to Gen Con a number of years now. I used to go, uh, actually, when I went to college, because I went to uh, Purdue University, which isn't too far from Indy. So to go down before classes started, 
So I've been there a few times then, and I've been, I don't know, the past three or four years now. I've always enjoyed it in the past, but I think now I'm ready to try a different con. I uh, only have enough wife points <laughs> to go to one con a year. And so while I do enjoy Gen Con, I have a lot of fun. I'm I'm not sure if I'm going to go back to Gen Con or do a different con next year. But yes, it is huge. There's always things to do. There's lots of places to play games if you know where to look. Lots of new games to, to buy and try out. I especially like demoing it. And I love networking and talking with people. Because generally at Gen Con, just about everyone's there. Or a lot of people are there that you can touch base with. So yeah, fun con. Cool. Yeah, my opinions on Gen Con are a little mixed. I, I do like it. I think it is an event that you need to go to at least once in your life. I will say that. For me, it's a little crowded. I agree and disagree with Jerry about running into people. I find that Origins and PAX U, I run into people that I know more often. Now, there are many more people at Gen Con, so I did randomly run into people that I know, but it felt like you had to hunt or look for them. There were certainly, I knew a bunch of people that were there that if I didn't schedule to meet up with them, I never would. I mean, Steve, you and I didn't meet till the last day that we were there. Well, no, we were there Wednesday night. That's, that's not true at all. I lied. <laughs> so never mind. But when you plan to meet with people, then, you know, it, there were plenty of places to meet. There were plenty of places to go. But it's such a big con. It's so spread out that, you know, you could miss somebody for the entire time you're there unless you really plan on meeting up with them. So I do like it. I think I like Origins a little bit better as far as meet and greets and like if you know a bunch of people. But if you're looking for the new hotness, there's no better convention to go to than Gen Con. All right. With that being said, I'm going to just talk about real quickly a couple games that I saw on the floor that I think you have to look forward to coming forward. There's Dawn of Madness that is done by the same people that did Deep Madness, which if you guys have listened to the episode is my favorite dungeon crawl as of right now. They also have another game called Celestia, which I'm really excited about. It's a miniatures tactical game that has co-op mode to it as well. Another game from Pandasaurus is a game called Mental Blocks, and I was really excited by this one. I didn't get a chance to play it, and I don't know why. It's like a really quick game, but it seemed to me to be a combination of the mind because you were trying to describe things to people, so it's not like you couldn't talk. But at the same time, you were the only one who could see your picture, and you're trying to describe these abstract shapes that it's really hard to describe and they had some restrictions on yourself. Like some people can only touch blue blocks. Some can only touch white blocks. So you're using other blocks to pick up your blocks and move them around. So, uh, and you all have a different view of this structure you're trying to build, but nobody has the complete picture and you may even be on the wrong side of the table. So you may have to move around to different sides of the table. So your view matches up with the view of the other person that you're working with or the other people you're working with to build the structure. And it goes from two to nine players. So it's a really interesting, unique co-op concept for me. So it's just timed. You're trying to build this structure together and you have some restrictions placed on you. So that one really stuck out to me and I wish I had got a chance to try it. Another one was Sherlock Files that's coming out from Indie Game Alliance. It is similar to these escape room games but it seems to have a little twist on it i know we tried to get that one to the table we didn't though so i'm looking forward to playing that one and getting back to you on it and the last one is the harry potter's miniature game it's a miniature game but they have a co-op mode to it as well so i'm excited i like the harry potter theme and i look forward to at least looking into that one a little bit more and i think that one's actually already out has anybody heard about it or tried that one Mm -mm. i think it landed with a thud i think it was on clearance at miniature market but i'm not sure all right, so you can get it cheap. Cheap miniatures for Harry Potter. There you go. And you can even play a co-op game with it if you try it. I didn't get a chance to try it, but the, the miniatures were beautiful, and it looked cool anyway. I mean, they did a great job with the miniatures part of it. So I don't know how much of a game there is there, but I look forward to at least looking into it a little bit more. All right, so I am going to post up all the pictures that I took. I didn't take a ton of them, but I got some up. I'm going to put them on the Patreon page. I'm going to put them on the Slack. So there are multiple places that people can view them. Go ahead there if you want to view those pictures that I got from it. I'm sure Steve will do the same. But we've kind of run out of time for today, so we're not going to talk about all the competitive games we played. Needless to say, though, Steve got to try Keyforge, and it was awesome. I did. It was a fun game. <laughs> and Peter won a Keyforge tournament. Yes, well, I wasn't going to mention that, but now that you say it, yeah, I, I, I won a Keyforge tournament. I was very happy about that. I, I'm glad I took the time to 
you know, sometimes we get so caught up in playing co-op games and, you know, doing coverage that we need to do that we don't get to do what we want to do. And I'm glad I took that time out to, you to know, beat other people down. Is that what you're saying? To, to beat other people down. Sometimes you just need that head to head smackdown moment. All right, Steve, any last parting thoughts from you about a uh, thing that really stuck out to you at the con? I'll just reiterate how incredibly excited for Marvel LCG. So I'm buying that one and I can't wait to uh, see how what where it evolves from. All right. How about you, Jerry? What's your game of the con? Oh, my game of the con? Probably the Marvel LCG. I think that one has the most potential for me to get into. Uh, there was also a Marvel Miniatures game that was released. I might be a sucker for that just because it's Marvel Miniatures. I did play a lot of games that are not co-ops or I played a lot of RPGs. I'll probably be posting my thoughts on those on the One Stop Co-op Shop Slack. Great. And my game of the con was Oathsworn. I, I, anybody who knows me isn't going to be surprised by this. It's a tactical combat game. The minute I threw the rat into its mom and smashed it into the tree, I was sold. You know, that's that's the kind of <laughs> stuff I just love. That's the kind of thing we're putting into spare parts. So I was super excited to see somebody else doing it as well. And it's just the kind of game I can't wait to get into the story. I hope, you know, the other part of the game, Mike says it's really good. I hope that's just as good. And so I'm really excited to see all the elements of that one put together and play more than just one turn of it. That, for me, is the one I'm most excited about, but I agree with both of you. I'm going to get Marvel as well. All right, Jerry, Steve, thank you so much for joining us on this special Gen Con episode. And before we get out of here, we want to thank a few of our Patreon backers, Pickle the Hut, Ben S., who are both co-op lovers, and John P., who is a co-op fan. Thank you so much for your support. If you want to support us yourself, please go over to patreon.com slash one stop. The link will be in the show notes. So thank you again to all of our great supporters. It's amazing to me how many people support only one show, and that show is the One Stop Co-op Shop. We really do appreciate you taking the time out to do it, and also for your patronage. It really has helped us do some things that we uh, love doing, including having more contests. So thank you all, and thank all of you out there for listening again. And the next two episodes are going to be very special episodes for us. We're going to be doing a bracket, top 32 games on BGG, all the top 32 co-op games listed from 1 to 32. We're going to seed them, so the 1 seed's going to play against the 32 seed. Now... There, the only other caveat to that is we most of us had to have played them. That's why I forced Steve to play the mine this weekend, <laughs> was to make sure that made it in the bracket. So we're going to take the top-ranked BGG games that are co-ops and put them against each other in head-to-head. So the first couple rounds of that will be in episode 99, and we're going to do the finale in episode 100. And Colin will be joining us for those episodes as well. So look forward to having Steve, myself, Colin, Elijah, and Mike all together at the same time doing a uh, head-to-head showdown on the top 32 co-ops on BGG. And with that, we're going to be doing another c c c contest So for this contest, you are going to have to guess and see if you can match up with our top 32 bracket. So yes, it's going to be a bracket challenge. And the person or people who are the closest, we will randomly select one of them to win a $50 gift card to your favorite online retailer. You'll find a link to the contest either in the show notes, on the Slack page, or on the Patreon page. So, good luck to everybody out there. You do need to submit for the contest before August the 17th, because the episode 99 goes up on the 18th, so clearly you'd have some knowledge beforehand, so please do it by next Saturday. So, good luck to everybody, and I look forward to the next two episodes. They should be pretty cool. And with that being said, thanks for joining us, and we will see you next week. See ya. Thanks for listening to another episode of the One Stop Co-op Shop podcast. Please check out our YouTube channel at One Stop Co-op Shop. If you want to reach out to us, the best place to talk to us all is on the Slack. See the show notes for details. Also, you can support us on Patreon. Check out patreon.com slash one stop. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you all next week with another Top 5 list. Do you want hey, to I'm Peter. And- oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> I was going to ask you if you want to lead it. Go ahead. Either way. No, do it. Yeah, and it's certainly something that, like a lot of these good cooperative games that are meant to be for families, talking Castle Panic, we're talking 
pandemic. We're talking Spirit Island, not Spirit Island. Sorry, let me start that over. Cool. All right. So the last one, Steve. I don't remember what it was. That's why I threw it to you. Is that the one or you want to talk about a different one? I can't remember. Wait, what was the last one? Watch? Oh, Set of Watch. That's right. Okay, I'll do Set of Watch. I got it. Pretty much everything you, you can imagine. Sorry, I have to get a charger for my phone. I'll be back. Keep talking. Steve, when he's done, you start talking. Yeah, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, fun con. All right, hold on. I'm almost back. Yeah, you, your microphone's the only one that's active, so I could be talking all I want, and <laughs> Steve can't hear me. <laughs> well, that's fine. I can hear you. Well, now you can. I can hear Jerry. Yes, now you're back. Yeah, you, you being on video killed my phone battery. Oh, sorry, I can turn No, no, it's all right, I'm just kidding. Hey, Jerry. What? Watch out for the car in front of us. I think it might be stopped. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, near-death experiences. Near-death experiences. Near-death experiences. Near-death experiences. Near-death experiences. Near-death experiences.